morning. It is Sunday, January 17, New York City. I am Dr. Sechkin on behalf of Endometriosis Foundation of America and with my distinguished guests and moderators, I am welcoming you again and recognizing you for participating in this wonderful event and joining us for our second day of Reoperative Endometriosis Endofound's virtual conference. As you all know, this was a conference that was scheduled to go late March and due to COVID, the conference was canceled. We had a wonderful, great day yesterday, honoring Dr. Arno Watier for his work, advancing the science of and surgery of endometriosis. Dr. Wadier talk was about surgery without mutilation. He reminded us how important it is not to remove the mesentery of this bowel in order to prevent complications. He reminded and underlined the importance of not to injure nerves. Congratulations, Dr. Watier. And second interesting presentation from yesterday was Dr. Leming Shen. At the molecular level, Dr. Leming, she presented us the molecular changes, epigenetic changes, a decade prior that was happening before the symptoms ever arise. I thought this was a groundbreaking presentation. I urge you to go back to visualize and listen to these presentation at Endofound's website. The password is capital E and F with Endofound 2020. And today, again, I'm joined by Dr. Rich, Dr. Martin, and Dr. Gomel for our second day participants. It is a two-hour presentation. There will be no lunch break. Please bear with me, with us. And initial session will be about deep endometriosis panel, Dr. John Einerson from Boston, Dr. Kazali from London, and Ted Lee from Pittsburgh will be joining us. First, Einerson will go with fixing hole and Kazali will take operative techniques for deep endometriosis surgery. And finally, Ted Lee will join us with his part, rectus muscle endometriosis and inguinal endometriosis. Lunchtime, Dr. Gomel will take the stand and will cover adolescent endometriosis, the timely detection. And finally, probably most of our panel will be joined by Dr. Lilo Metril, Tomer Singer, and Punar Kodaman. I'm excited to start the session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think my session was very, it was basically just on how to manage complications. I think that the most important thing with uh, when we're doing endometriosis surgery is that uh, it is it is a complicated uh, surgery and we do sometimes make uh, holes into organs that we're not supposed to or not intending necessarily to make holes into. I think the most important thing is to recognize that and repair it. Uh, the uh, the dangerous complications are where uh, patients have uh, especially thermal injuries that we don't recognize. And, um, and those are the patients that, uh, that unfortunately don't do very well. Uh, um, I mean, I think that's the gist of it. I, I think it's hard to summarize uh, complications in laparoscopic surgery in, in two minutes, but I, I, that's, that's sort of the most that's the, the, the core of the message, I guess. The deep endometriosis surgery is uh, something that we always face the difficulties. I think in the end, our fears is, fear is to not have a complication. And we really don't know many times what the end is gonna be. And the team is important. Yesterday's one of the um, most highlighting part of Dr. Watier's speech was he he showed a slide about about it's the singer it's the singer and and that's all he said basically but in your 
experience, tell me what your band is about. Who are your, what, what, what is your level of expertise of people that helps you in the room and uh, how you manage multi-organ approaches at times in this uh, uh, politically and, uh, and, and also obviously medical legally uh, exposed situation we fall in, in multi-organ surgery. In what cases you call uh, assistance and how do you work with the colorectal plus the thoracic surgeons and the urologist? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I think everybody has a little different, I've seen people practice in very different ways in different countries. Uh, but I think that my situation is probably similar to most people in the US, meaning that I, I draw the line if, if we need to do a bowel resection, we need to you know, use staplers, then uh, I will usually work with the colorectal surgeons to do the stapling. Uh, and, and also if in, uro in, uh, in terms of the urologists, if we need to do a, uh, if, if there's an end-to-end -end anastomosis of the ureter, then I will generally do that myself. But if there's a re-implantation, that's where I draw the line. Even though I would love to do it myself, uh, they wouldn't be very happy with me, I think, the urologist, if I did it. So uh, I will call them for that. Ladder, I will repair myself. Bowel, if it's a bowel injury, like a hole in the bowel, I will repair that myself as well. But again, if, there, if stapling has to be done, uh, I will call the general surgeons. Um, in terms of the diaphragm, um, if there is a through and through lesion, I think they should have that's done as well because you could have some endo up in the thoracic cavity and so I do work with the uh, thoracic surgeons on that um, so uh, we'll we'll do a joint procedure where they'll do the vats procedure and I'll do the the uh, endometriosis on the diaphragm um, so yeah so absolutely important to have uh, a multidisciplinary approach is is important and I think that if you if you can manage the complication of whatever you do yourself, then you then I, and you can do the whatever you're doing well, then I think you you should be allowed to do it. But if you cannot manage the complication yourself of what you're doing, then perhaps you shouldn't be doing it on your own to begin with. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, I think it's important to emphasize for our viewers. Uh, we have close to 500 viewers. I'm hoping that's how many registered, but usually we drop that. But there are some doctors, if none of, some of them are not doctors, but in general, uh, the audience should be aware many times these so-called site specialists of other or others uh, from other specialties have no clue in general about endometriosis, how the lesions look like. So they only see a pigmented lesion as lesions. They don't recognize and respect the fibrotic tissue, which may harbor and pull the tissues together and cause problem. So we end up teaching them and we have to stick around and do not let them do what they have to do and show them where the disease is. When even in thoracic cavity, even in other parts of retroperitoneum number one, I think it's very crucial. And, um, yeah, and I, also I, the, the value of uh, dedicated OR, the value of dedicated personnel and immediate supply of uh, equipment and flawless surgery, seamless procedure is, is the key. Yeah, uh, you're right. You're right in that those, they, for example, the thoracic surgeons are not uh, accustomed to de dealing with endometriosis. But what I generally do is uh, I have found two of them that are interested and that we work together consistently. So they have now become very comfortable with it. Uh, so that's, that's the key. To, Absolutely, to they feel there. privileged to be us after a point because they're convinced they go behind your back and check the pathology and they receive it. They start, start scratching their head. Oh my God, we're learning something. This mm -hmm. happened to me for the last 25 years at Lenexel Hospital and I'm really privileged to have them around. Dr. Kazali, would you like to add your, your own practice or the practice habits in London? What's going on there? I have practiced in three very different environments. So perhaps I can share something. I think um, um, a couple of things to say on that. Um, 
One is we shouldn't forget that all of this is about the patient. So we are all working for the benefit of the patient and it's the patient that is at the center of all of this. So when we say multidisciplinary team, some uh, may just picture a number of specialists uh, getting together. I don't think that's a team. A team is when these specialists all sing from the same hymn sheet. And what I have found very useful is uh, for these specialists that work with me to see the patients before and after the surgery, for them to see and believe the disease and why we're doing all of this. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I used to go to Iran, that's now eight, nine years ago. Um, and we used to do a very large number of very complex disease uh, over a course of seven, eight days that I was in there. We had two ORs and we had the colorectal surgeon there for all cases because all we did was very complex endometriosis. And we had a urologist who wasn't a laparoscopic surgeon, Dr. Araste, but he was so interested that he would stay in, in the OR watching the surgery, seeing the patients before and after. And after a while, when we were doing ureteric reimplantations, I was his robot, basically, with him watching over my shoulder, doing the ureteric reimplantation. And later on, he carried on doing it. But the only reason that wasn't a problem for him was that he had seen these patients. He knew how much they are suffering. And he had seen how these patients would suffer if they are opened by someone who doesn't understand the disease. So I really couldn't agree more than having a coherent team that uh, um, know exactly what's going on, even without needing to say the word, they know exactly what the next move will be is just priceless. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. O overall, I, I, I have to tell you, I assigned that topic to Dr. Einerson because I know I could trust he could answer that. It could be Dr. Ted, Dr. Ted Lee too. But fixing the hall is the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, point procedure we can do for it. If we have to fix the hall and we have to fix it right, that's the key. At times, mm -hmm. you may have even vascular surgery, vascular injury yeah. until they yeah. come. I had my own vein perforations that I had to repair be laparoscopically before the guy came because you yeah. don't know when he may be coming. So yeah. this is, otherwise it is impossible to do this surgery. You gotta Absolutely. fix the holes and write yeah. at times double yeah. layer, at times single layer, it's about fixing the hole. Mostly bowel, Absolutely. do not, do not bowels, bowel misses could be mortal sepsis, patient may stay in the hospital, may days with peritonitis, and it's very, very painful for all, all of us. May uh, I, come in, I, uh, I just uh, want Dr. Lee to add certain things. I know he's experienced in this part as much as we are. Go ahead. I, I concur with Dr. Kazali and, and Dr. Ineson. I think one of the things that I think we should emphasize uh, you know, with the audience is that anticipation is really key to a lot of this multidisciplinary uh, uh, team that we, we're trying to, to, uh, to develop to, for the care of the patients. So as the, the, as, the, as the surgeon, as the captain of the team, you have to anticipate scenarios based on your workup. And then, you know, so that you, the surgeons, so normally, and as, as same as Dr. Ghazali, if I anticipate that this, the patient may need some kind of bowel surgery, either from discoid resection, which I would do myself. If patient is going to have enough segmental resection, the general surgeon will do uh, for the patients. I have the patient see the general surgeons ahead mm -hmm. of time, just like Dr. Kazali. So really the proper workup anticipation is the key to have an effective, effective team. And so if you do not anticipate and not properly work the patient up ahead of time, and be able to consent the patients appropriately ahead of time, then even if you have the skills, you, you may not be able to use it at a time when it's needed. So anticipation is really the key uh, to the success of a multidisciplinary team. So that's kind of my take on, on, this, on this matter. 
Thank you. Dr. Martin, do you have any questions coming from the audience? I've, got one, I've got one here that uh, I think anyone, I think this can for the entire audience, it was directed to Ted Lee, but we'll let everyone have it. After successful surgery, what's next in managing endometriosis? How do you watch for recurrence, risks, chance of damage to other organs, any precursors to ovarian or other cancers? What monitoring do you suggest? Who wants to take over that case, uh, Dr. Lee? Well, it all depends on the case itself. Uh, obviously, in a lot of my patients, if uh, they are trying to uh, get pregnant, uh, then I tell them after surgery that they, they should try to get pregnant as long as the, the fallopian tubes are open. Uh, if they are not uh, planning to, to conceive anytime soon, uh, typically for severe endometriosis, I, I normally talk to the patient about suppressive therapy with uh, progestins. Uh, because I don't care how good you are as a surgeon, when it comes to severe endometriosis, there is a lot of potential for residual disease uh, that may have been missed just because of the distortion of anatomy, uh, so, as well as patient who has been operated on several times before. So there's always a potential for residual disease. So as long as they can tolerate progestin therapy, uh, as long as they are looking to get pregnant anytime soon, that's kind of my main state. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, of uh, afterwards, but obviously everything in terms of monitoring, for the most part, is going to be symptom based. If you are feeling well and don't have pain, we don't have to do anything. So that's would be my kind of my 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 uh, general follow up for the patient who have uh, surgery for severe endometriosis. May I uh, pick up the cancer uh, point? So. Um, the, we are just writing um, guidelines for ESHRI, and uh, I'm working with a, a group uh, about the cancer uh, side of endometriosis. And I think it's very important to give the right message that even though we do know that uh, endometriosis, particularly endometriosis of the ovary, does increase the risk of cancer formation, this risk is small. In, in terms of absolute risk. So we shouldn't uh, worry patients uh, unnecessarily. And uh, at the moment, um, I'm not going to uh, give out the whole um, uh, guideline as it's not final yet, but we are not going to recommend routine uh, follow-up for everyone with endometriosis only because of cancer risk. The risk is there, the patients need to be informed. Uh, we think it's the lifetime risk is 1.7%, uh, but uh, that's, not, um, that's not something that would uh, then warrant removal of ovaries or removal of, of organs, uh, just to reduce that risk. Okay, uh, thank you very much. There are questions, but I'm gonna keep some of the questions in the end. I think uh, I... I failed to introduce Dr. Einerson. Dr. Einerson is the Richard Tellin Distinguished Professor of Department of OBGYN and Oncology at, at Boston uh, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, there are questions for you coming later, but I think for the time's uh, sake, we have to move on. Dr. Uh, Shahin Kazali is, the, is coming from the Center of Endometriosis and Minimally Invasive Gynecology, United Kingdom, London. He talked about, his video is about operative techniques for deep endometriosis surgery. Uh, he has interesting approach. He, his uh, talk could be highlighted as good knowledge of the anatomy of peritoneal and space. Good team, as we were discussing. Good tools are essential for successful surgery. He has a method of so sure technique uh, survey and sigmoid mobilization, ovary mobilization, suspension, and ovaries uterolysis. So sure techniques can ensure the best outcome achieved. I'm not so sure about that, but I agree with you. Most of the time we do the same thing, but I'm at Ted Lee's team. Ted Lee, I remember saying also, which we all know, but he, he, I saw him saying that. You don't go to the eye of the storm you have to, in every case is different. You have to surround the pathology and attack later. That's sometimes I think possible, possibly 
complement to the so sure technique. I loved it though. It's so sure is good. Go ahead. Summarize what you, you felt in, in uh, your presentation and how do you feel right now about your presentation? Uh, is that directed to me? Yes, it's about yes, your okay. Design. So, um, so yes, it's uh, so sure is not a is not a new technique. I haven't really um, uh, introduced anything, unlike uh, um, Harry uh, reaches here and the rest of you who've done much bigger things. This basically is just a, a reminder that, uh, like any other surgery, having a structured approach is helpful. So we all do things differently, and that's absolutely fine. Um, and, uh, and particularly for more senior surgeons uh, who are completely used to uh, a particular way that works for them, I, I do not suggest any change at all. But social um, uh, is a helpful way in our view to remind newer uh, surgeons and perhaps uh, less uh, experienced colleagues that to have a structure uh, in your surgery is not only helpful for you, it's helpful for the team. If everybody in OR knows that your next step is now going to be to expose the pelvic structures, they're going to be prepared for your next move. If your trainees, your fellows know that you uh, always follow the um, say ovarian suspension with ureterolysis and that is a routine that's going to be helpful and the other point that i was making in my uh, presentation and this has been repeated so many times but i felt that uh, uh, the the importance cannot be overemphasized um, is to treat the patient not the disease we sometimes forget that you know, we think that if there is a nodule, what do we do with this nodule? I think that's the wrong question. We should ask, what do we do with this patient and how do we work with the patient to find the best way of treating her? And that may include removal of that nodule. So these are the uh, two things that I was uh, hoping to highlight in my, in my talk. I think it is crucial, one of the problems uh, in endometriosis surgery in, I don't think we are communicating with each other to the point of perfection of the procedures. There are so many opinions yet we may be doing similar things, but it would help if we sing along, have a harmony. I do agree with this. I mean, we, for example, we, I do the same thing. First, you mobilize the sigmoid, suspend the ovaries and then attack the peritoneum, whatever, wherever. And, you know, everybody has different approach further on, but it hasn't been, we, do, we lack standardization. We lack, uh, we, lack the, uh, we lack the techniques of, that could be easily be followed and we will all be on page. And I think uh, Ted and, uh, and Dr. Einerson are frequent um, attendees of uh, teaching seminars and everything. And I like them to take this also follow it on. How about, how can we standardize certain things? Is there a possibility for this for teaching endometriosis surgery? I think what, what uh, Dr. Kozali described is pretty standardized. Um, I mean, I think for severe endometriosis with bilateral endometrioma, bilateral perimetrial involvement, rectal vaginal involvement, you know, the, the, what he described is very, very routine. It's what we do pretty much on all patients with uh, the stage four endometriosis is that we basically to perform the ovarian cystectomy first and then get the ovary suspended, get it out of the way and uh, remove all the disease in the pelvic sidewall and the perimetrium. Um, and then, you know, open the perirectal fossa and then address the central disease. It's a pretty much at this time, at this time of the, of development of the surgery, I think it's very standardized at this point. I don't know anybody else do it differently at this point because that is, and you know, in the beginning of endometriosis surgery, a lot of the surgery called te surgical techniques are not very anatomically based. But over the years, this has become much more anatomically based procedures uh, compared to what we have done in the past, you know, even compared to what we did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But what Kazali has described is pretty much standard, and I'm sure Ineson will agree with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the the 
what I what we generally talk about is circle the dragon, which is kind of what you said before. You know, you don't want to attack the dragon right away. You you get the easy parts done first. So you get a better sense of uh, where the difficult parts are, uh, and so we have a very similar approach. So in that way, I think that that we are maybe fairly standardized. I do think though that uh, a big problem is that you know we are uh, maybe all here um, high volume. We've been doing this for a while, but I see unfortunately so many patients that have been operated on elsewhere, uh, maybe by not by people who do a lot of this, where either they had incomplete uh, surgery uh, or or just you know uh, not uh, not the appropriate care. Uh, and so I think that that's that's the, that's the big problem is to is to uh, standardize or get the training up uh, or maybe set standards where you shouldn't be operating on certain things if you don't have the necessary ex expertise or experience with it, which is very difficult to do. Uh, but some countries have done that already, where there are minimum you know there are only a few centers that are allowed to do endometriosis surgery, they have to have minimum uh, experience and volume. And I do think that that is probably, if, if the patient is really what, we're, what we care about, which of course it should be, then uh, I think we should be, we should have uh, some guidelines in place for that. Yeah, I, yes. agree with, I agree with Yang. I think, you know, um, ability to distinguish someone who is skilled sur a skilled surgeon to take care of severe endometriosis for someone who is not is very, very important. Unfortunately, that we currently do not have a system here in the United States. I know in UK, they have a, a, a system, although it's somewhat more basic. Maybe Dr. Kazali can address that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this is, uh... If you like my hobby horse, I've been involved in, in setting up three uh, centers under that jurisdiction. Um, the fact that there are there is a system and there are some criteria, I think, is better than nothing. Uh, the system, as you said, is very basic. In my opinion, the bar is set far too low. Um, and uh, I've been an advocate of uh, changing that. But the essence is very important. So the criteria to become a center is that you need to have a dedicated specialist nurse for endometriosis. I think that in itself is a massive improvement. You need to have certain volume, which is far too low. At the moment, it's set at 12 severe endometriosis per year. And I think that should be per month at least. Um, uh, but that's beside the point. You need to have dedicated team of surgeon, uh, ureter, um, uh, urologist, pain specialist, etc. But more importantly, you need to submit your outcome data, including quality of life scores, pain scores at six, twelve, and twenty-four months, and you are and your data is published. So I think even if say in the United States, that is not possible for whatever reason. Publishing the data for patients to then choose who to see, would you want to go and see someone who does 12 endometriosis cases a year or someone who does 12 endometriosis cases a week? It's your choice. And I think that would then drive the uh, complex uh, cases to surgeons who have true interest and experience in the field. But it's not just that surgeon. We need to remember that volume also means you can do research. Volume means you can train the next generation of surgeons. If you're doing 12 a year, you're not going to be able to teach anyone. Uh, if you're very lucky, you will keep your, your skills. And volume also means that the managers of that hospital will see that there is a financial incentive to invest in that service. So it makes perfect sense. Centralization of endometriosis uh, uh, um, care, I think makes a lot of sense to everyone. I, th I think the success of the UK system is that it's endorsed by the national healthcare system. That's and right. that is what really ensures success. To have a system like this in this country we would need to have somebody at the level of the CDC or FDA or some 
government bodies to endorse that. And that's really the key. And then if we can do campaign for a system like that, you know, we that would be where we need to go. Yeah. You know that 10 to 50% of the endo patients may be reoperated. And the most vulnerable group is the is the, maybe the early cases that comes back for surgery. And when we say who is to blame, the disease, the patient, the surgeon, the other doctors, mm. GI and uh, general surgeon, insurance companies, government, public, I, I think we have to blame ourselves first. And it is the surgeons, it's the doctor medical community which hasn't really come to the grip of this disease. And we have to agree as a, and work together and really communicate well. When it comes to endometriosis, we all depend on saying the diseases when the glands and stroma are found outside the uterus. Yeah, but hey, who is doing the, where is the tissue? Where is the tissue? Where is the evidence that you're doing it? So we have to agree on the evidence. Ev the only evidence we have is patient testimonials. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't patients, maybe we wouldn't be here. This foundation was found basically, well, I thought it was necessary, but I couldn't move, move an inch unless somebody who has a recognizable face came and said, oh, it's my vagina, it's my internals are hurting and nobody helped me, it was helped. And everybody, every one of you has had this similar experience in your practices. You know it's helping, you know removing the tissue, you know we have to put it on the, and, and get a bite. So I think when we say standardization of surgery, if it doesn't come to the tissue examination and verification by the pathologist, the validation on patients' minds and brains is not gonna happen. I am pursuing this subject because I am insisting such standardization going to tissue biopsy rather than just technique of, uh, of uh, mm. sure tech, so, so, sure, so sure technique, which is fine, but so sure technique should extend tissue diagnosis, I'm hoping. Dr. Gomel, you want to say something, I could tell. Pardon? Okay, you are not muted anymore, go ahead. No, I'm not muted, I never mute. <laughs> <laughs> look, it, it, look the, the problem is, uh, integrity. A physician, especially a surgeon, shouldn't do anything that he doesn't know very well. This is why we have specialists and integrity comes from there. If a person doesn't that he doesn't know how to do a complex surgery of endometriosis, it shouldn't do it. He should, he should refer to somebody else. That's integrity. I have never done a procedure if I knew that there was somebody who can do it better. Thank you, Dr. Gomel. Thank you very much. Would Harry Lurich say something about this subject? Please. Uh, please. Uh, Tamir, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to emphasize what we heard yesterday because uh, I, I've heard that everyone this morning and Arnaud Wadiez emphasized the concept of the complete pelvic surgeon yesterday. And we know endometriosis involves the rectovaginal septum, and that means rectum. And uh, I, I just still can't understand. I've been away from it for, for 15 years, but I still can't understand why more gynecologists don't manage the rectum on their own. Because we know more than, I think, than, uh, than, gyne than uh, general surgeons who operate occasionally on the rectum. So I'd like to all the all the uh, panel to address this subject. Okay, we will come to this again uh, because there are some questions about insurance companies. But since we are, um, 
about this disease, whether it is progressive disease, whether it's rec recurrent disease or incomplete surgery, uh, Dr. Dan Martin will probably review his own talk for us. P uh, Dan, please. But before that, uh, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to recognize Dr. Ihan, who's uh, joining us from uh, Japan, three o'clock in the morning. I felt bad, I told her, but then she said, of course I'll get up and she joined us. There is, there are any questions to her, please uh, keep your questions on the side and we like to get her back to bed. If we get any questions for her in the next 10 minutes, we'll interrupt and we'll like her to go to bed again. It's three o'clock in, in uh, Tokyo today. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Dan Martin, please take the podium. My talk basically was why we missed endometriosis and why it is therefore difficult to determine whether it is missed or it came back. Our biggest problem is that we miss it because we don't see it and it's only found on histology. We can't see it, but you can find it with a rectal probe. We can't see it, but you can palpate it in laparotomy. It's non-visualized and sometimes found on dissection or it could be microscopic or a stem cell. That's just the short version. This is the long version. So the long version is all of that. We're not gonna cover that, but those are all the different ways we know to miss endometriosis, not recognize it, interfere with ability to see it. And in addition, the lookalike lesions that confuse the whole issue. The summary is this is a very complex, difficult concept. And there's really no good way to tell whether endometriosis at second surgery is recurrent or something that was missed. Most of what I saw in my practice was surgery that had been missed either by me or someone else. On deep rectovaginal endometriosis, the recurrence was almost at the perimeter of where my excision ended. And my guess is I didn't excise deep enough. I was looking for some questions. Um, um, the, one of the questions coming up has to do with the, with the uh, for all of you, because it's a crucial pro uh, question. What are we doing to fight back on the treatment limitations dictated by insurance companies? Discussing operative strategies is great, but how are we going to make sure the people who need this treatment have access to it? Um, I think Dr. Lee has more experience because I know he's, uh, he's uh, in charge of coding and some of the dealings of these problems with the, with the government and the insurance companies. He was, a f Ted, would you like to address this a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it is a very, very complex problem. Obviously I was in our, been trying to tackle this uh, for many years. Uh, I uh, the age of liaison to the ACA coding committee and we've been trying to change in the codes and obviously there's a lot of politics involved. And I think obviously, you know, a lot of it's kind of has been done slowly. Uh, lately, I think we're having some success at least to uh, changing the, hopefully changing the diagnosis, ICD codes, uh, diagnosis code for endometriosis. I think even the diagnosis, uh, many of the diagnosis that we thought uh, will be very straightforward is not even listed in the ICD code. Uh, for example, uh, that uh, bladder endometriosis and diaphragm diaphragmatic endometriosis all have the same code uh, because they are li listed under uh, unless basically uh, uncategorized code because there's no codes for them. So there are many things that we're working on. And so the, the diagnosis code for endometriosis had not been changed for 40 years. My goal is to establish the, uh, the revised codes and later on we will then tackle the procedure codes and that has its own challenges. So it, it's uh, surely not ideal, uh, but we are working slowly to get that change. Uh, even as I, I'm currently the president of AGL, even if I get off my, uh, in, in the, the executive board of AGL, we'll continue to work uh, with uh, the patient advocacy group, as well as some of the governmental agency trying to change uh, what is uh, what can be corrected. Uh, so, so right now, I think we, we're gonna um, 
submit, uh, we have already submitted our revision of uh, RCD10 codes for endometriosis to the CDC. And, uh, and we got very good positive response on the first review. We have, we have making additional revisions, uh, but I feel pretty confident that would change. So at least we can validate the presence of various forms of endometriosis through the diagnosis codes. And after that, my goal is to change the procedure code. Um, I cannot guarantee everybody's gonna be rich after things are reestablished, you know, because obviously you are being compared to cardiothoracic surgery and many other surgery uh, procedures. So, but in the end, um, you know, I think the first thing is to, to have the, the diagnosis and be able to track the disease. Uh, and when you build a track the disease and able to, to document your success of your treatment, as Dr. Kazali have, have, have mentioned that the, the center of excellence in UK, not only it, it to show people's uh, ability or different centers ability to treat the disease, but be able to track the outcome. And using those information, then we can, you know, over time be able to change the, the, the coding for, uh, and then maybe change the insurance reimbursement for the procedure we perform. Yeah, the, the reality is that the system is, is broken the way it is now. Uh, if, just a, as an example, if, if, if I get a patient that was operated on by somebody else and it clearly states in their operative report that they didn't feel comfortable removing all the endometriosis and they cut a little bit or burned a little bit and then referred them to me uh, appropriately, then I will do the case and it'll take me maybe three hours to do it. Uh, I get paid exactly the same as the person that burned a couple of things and then sent the patient to me to finish the job. We get paid the same for the same code. And that doesn't, that, that's just not, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and, and that's in a nutshell sort of the problem. And that's why we see uh, some providers that uh, are doing a lot of this that they, they don't they go into, you know, they, they, they start uh, or stop taking insurance because they, they don't feel like they can, they're being adequately reimbursed. But the pro there's a problem with that too, because then a lot of times those outcomes are never published. We don't really know what's going on there. Um, and, and a lot of patients may not have the ability to, to seek care because they have to pay more out of pocket. So the system really, the way it is now is, is, is really not ideal uh, if we think again about the patient as the main well thing. insurance companies makes money by not paying the doctor or the sister the the even the hospital so they're convenient to bundle so your procedure you, you do on different organs are bundled under the roof of maybe just diagnostic laparoscopy plus something and the minimal of that so i think for the for the providers being transparent having a very eloquent, correct uh, OR report, uh, substantiated by live video and patients standing by you is, is, is important. If I'm talking about even out of network situations. I think patient has a contract with the insurance company. In out of network situation, we don't. So patients can stand by their, by their physician and support that. That's, the, that's a good way of approach in that, but politically, Politically, when it's HMO, you are going to be equally treated with the Medicare standards and pushed down as far as the payment schedule. What Ted Lee is doing, incredible. I, I, we like to be part of that, even though we tried to be, but it didn't happen. I think the foundation would love to hear where you are with it and what we can do. We would be more than glad to assist if we can. Yeah, I would love to collaborate with the foundation to some of the important uh, endeavors that we're trying to do to help to correct some of the coding structures that we currently have. I okay, I'm going to move on to one yeah. more question. This is to Ted Lee. One of your um, loyal, beloved patient is writing to you. How to manage recurrence of endo post-surgery? I was lucky enough to have Dr. Ted Lee perform my incredible miracle surgery beyond type four over seven years ago. I have since been blessed with three beautiful children. I am facing the question, what is next for me in managing endo? How do you stay on top of risk recurrence? Signs to look for risk of damage to other organs. 
I had severe bowel and bladder issues. Risk of precursor to cancer. What ongoing monitoring would you do? Please go ahead. I think it's a long question, but you can yeah. be very simple and because well, I, he's I a think, fan of you, right? You can oh, get away with it. <laughs> well, I think it's very similar to what I had mentioned before. I think for for most of the monitoring is going to be symptom based. Uh, at this point, for her to to have three ki children uh, after you know aggressive you know radical debulking of endometriosis, I mean that's you know that's very very uh. uh very, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, and then if she's not having symptoms, pretty much don't, you know, obviously you need to have follow up with your, your gynecologist and or you know, follow up with me to, to make sure there's no, you know, evidence of recurrence based on exam, but the symptoms is what we normally kind of address. So if, you know, if you're doing well, count your blessings and then and, and go from there and just have your yearly exam. And obviously sometimes, a lot of uh, your general OBGYNs do not do a uh, do a very cursory exam, and they might have missed some of the earlier signs. So, like for example, if a patient come to see me and they have previous history of stage four endometriosis or bowel and bladder involvement, and they are doing well, and I'll examine them, and I would pick up say, well, you're having some tenderness in the retrocervical region, for example, and that may be a sign of something is coming back. But many of those patients who have endometriosis and who now have three children, the most likely scenario at this point for those type of patients that can be endomyosis. And as they get older, they will get, begin to have more experiencing a heavier bleeding, a little more cramping from their endomyotic uterus. But as long as you're not having symptoms, I would just say, leave it alone. Well, in Harry's term, she is cured. Yeah. So right. she, exactly. <laughs> she is cured. She has children, she's asymptomatic. In significant patients that you do good surgery, you don't hear from them. They continue with their life and don't want to even remember. They even forget what, what they went through. We have to also see the other part of the story there. Uh, I'm sure... Uh, She's go ahead, Tara, you say something? She's cured. I mean, come on. We, we operate, hopefully, you know, I, I hate this idea that it may be coming back after 20 years. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, if you removed it back there 20 years ago, it's gone. I have but to ask the remaining of this. Uh, the patient that. Harry, I, I just want to, for just courtesy, for the gracefulness of Dr. Ihan connected us. The last part of this question was, what um, if I had endometriosis surgery, what are my risk of getting ovarian cancer? As a pathologist, shortly I say, she was part of the Dr. Leming group as you heard yesterday, Dr. Xi gave an incredible speech about the molecular basis of uh, epigenetic basis of endometriosis, how the disease really starts epigenetically 10 years prior, the symptoms even start. And he proved this incredible molecular uh, markings on his, with his research. Aisha is part of his team from John Hopkins. Aisha, in your experience, what are we looking at as far as the ovarian cancer, tubal cancer, and endometrial cancer from the endometriosis point of view? Are they in more risk? Do they need, um, if for example, there's a family history of ovarian cancer, do they need, regardless of what their BRC said, says, would they need prophylactic ophorectomy with uh, more dissection of the pelvic side walls? Thank you for the question. Certainly, uh, even if the patient does completing the uh, family, uh, patient should have uh, not ovary. Uh, particularly, fallopian tubes should be removed if it is a, B, a, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 family. But for, for uh, in the case of Lynch families, which uh, more occurs for uh, endometriosis related ovarian cancers. Um, the, uh, the question is more, uh, is not uh, solved yet. However, uh, apparently uh, the, the risk is higher if, if there is a genetic alteration. Uh, or a genetic a genetic mutation in the family, but most tumors occur uh, 
uh, in somatic uh, cells. So uh, most of the ovarian cancer is associated with um, endometrial. The patient should not uh, be, I mean, very afraid of it. However, uh, especially it occurs uh, on the background of endometrioma, not endometriosis itself, but uh, endometri uh, endometriosis-related cancers in ovary occur um, in the background of endometrioma. So we have to be afraid of endometrioma rather than endometriosis. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for staying awake. I, I really feel bad uh, that you're calling us from Japan. No, no problem please, at all. Please this go is, back to bed. Pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm, re I, I'm here for, for the questions. We are, uh, unfortunately, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to have any lunch break. This is a short, uh, short meeting. So I like to give the, um, I like to proceed uh, if Dr. Martin has any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to proceed with Dr. Gomel's uh, uh, keynote for today. Dr. Martin, are there any questions before we go forward with Dr. Gomel? There's some additional questions on hysterectomy and on, on nerve sparing, but those can probably come up later with Dr. Paso, who is in. Is he joining us today? Isn't he I'm joining not sure. I'm not sure if he's joining. Let's move on with Dr. Gomel. Dr. Gomel, as you all know, uh, he is the father of microsurgery without those principles that it's impossible to perform precision surgery. In other words, bone dry hemostasis at the capillary level, copious irrigation like Harry does has been my guidance. I have followed him through years and he's been father and mentor for all of us. And one of the reasons we haven't here. So Dr. Gomel is gonna talk this time some area that is somewhat he's excited about. That's the adolescent endometriosis. Dr. Gomel. I am Victor Gomel from Vancouver. I am honored to be invited by Dr. Sechkin to contribute to this virtual conference and we'll be talking about adolescent endometriosis. Look, uh, endometriosis is a difficult and enigmatic disease, a disease that affects only women directly and her environment, partner, family, etc indirectly, but significantly. Endometriosis produces chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, dysparunia, dyscasia, and a lot of depression. It affects women of reproductive age. It is a polymorphic disease in appearance, in the variability of severity of symptoms, and it is frequently progressive and invasive. A disease diagnosed with increasing frequency, and it is commonest cause of pelvic pain in women of reproductive age. Today, we will discuss the etiology, mechanism of invasion, mechanism of production of pain, what causes the variability of forms, reasons for increasing incidence. Adolescent endometriosis causes dysmenorrhea and chronic pelvic pain, more likely with non-cyclical pain. Recent studies demonstrate a much greater proportion of advanced disease in teenagers, stage four from 50% to 88.9% and some with deep endometriosis. Camera plan Here, doing you can see your... the articles listed below. 
subsequent to the initial diagnosis of six deep endometriosis cases, nine more patients develop deep endometriosis at repeat laparoscopy. This is the follow-up data from 50 adolescents in a French case series. Furthermore, three 50% of the original six patients later developed recurrent deep endometriosis, giving a total of 12 cases with deep endometriosis during the follow-up. Adolescent endometriosis appears to be more common than it is thought to be. All forms of endometriosis, including endometriomas and deep endometriosis are present in adolescents. There is evidence that the condition progresses even after treatment, at least in some patients. Here on the left, you see a diffuse deep infiltrating lesion. We have to have awareness, we have to search, and we have to have expertise. Endometriosis is a lifelong disease that can affect almost every organ in the body. The hormonal imbalance and the pro-inflammatory milieu alter neuronal signaling systems, which can alter pain processing. Endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory disease and may cause injury to the somatosensory nervous system. Endometriotic lesions can produce nerve growth factor, NGF, which may cause peripheral sensitization. If adolescents with endometriosis and pain are not treated promptly, they may develop central sensitization and chronic pain. Chronic pain is a disease in itself. The diagnosis is often delayed, lending to suffering for several years, and there is a need for early diagnosis of endometriosis in adolescents with dysmenorrhea and CPP, chronic pelvic pain. For more than a century, endometriosis was believed to occur after 20 to 23 years of age. In a series of 400 cases published by Joe Vincent Meigs, only one was less than 29 years old. In a larger series of 884 cases of the Mayo Clinic, the youngest patient was 21 years of age. And Samson himself remembered that he had seen no patient who was younger. An endometriosis series of 225 cases published in JAMA in 1946 reported nine patients, 4%, to be less than 20 years of age. The author, Dr. Fallon, states further that 4% is a small figure, but our grounds for suspecting that it is less than the true one, and it is a significant, even a large percentage, when weighed against the common belief that youth does not have endometriosis. And among the total group, there was a 13-year-old a 17-year-old one, three 18-year-olds, and four 19-year-olds for a total of nine patients. Fallon in his article further states, seven other authors give passing mention to endometriosis in the teens. Their ages varied between 14 and 19 years old. All these series were published before 1946 to be included in Fallon's article. 
Nonetheless, despite these observations and warnings, the practice did change for many decades and diagnosis and treatment was delayed in adolescents suffering from endometriosis. Adolescent and prepubertal pre endometriosis is a significant cause of cyclic and acyclic chronic pelvic pain. The diagnosis of endometriosis in this population requires a high index of suspicion, a thorough history and physical examination, utilization of the laboratory and imaging modalities where appropriate. We have to investigate the patient's menstrual history, detailed history of pain, onset, location, nature, severity, timing, concurrent symptoms, etc. Detailed abdominal and pelvic examination and other systems associated with concurrent symptoms. And obviously, imaging modalities were appropriate. We must uh, test complete blood work, including CRP, urine analysis and culture, test for sexually transmitted infections when indicated, imaging modalities where appropriate, ultrasonography and MRI when indicated, to diagnose and or rule out other conditions. Initially, it is important to start with uh, non-steroidal medica medication and hormonal treatment. And we should use diagnostic laparoscopy to definitive diagnosis on, and management. The patient should be counseled. Endometriosis is a chronic disease and will often require long-term hormonal treatment to reduce the risk of the disease, recurrence, and progression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gomel. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not getting any online question to you, but uh, does um, our speakers panel moderates any specific questions to Dr. Gomel? then I can ask something to him. Um, we do not see deeply endometriosis in adolescent population or young women as much. However, we are seeing more and more even then. So the issue of their future fertility becomes the main concern as well as their symptoms. There, the family gets alarmed, uh, everyone. The word endometriosis is so fearful thing right now. Uh, one of the uh, specific questions really coming like, this was question for Eric Ozuki. Unfortunately, he can't be with us. Uh, like Passover, Eric was sick, Passover is buried under snow, he says. But the question goes like this, how emotions and the image of what is to be woman affect fertility and Creation of endometriosis, adenomyosis, uh, how do young women should, should really feel? How do we, what can we do not to make them totally feared of, the, of this so-called, whatever we picture as horrific maybe? I think we should, there's a, this is a beautiful question should be handled very delicately. Our job should in younger generation should not be uh, creating a fearful uh, atmosphere in the family. But I think the endometriosis is, is highly treatable disease. And the role of especially egg freezing could be an issue for the next panel. But Dr. Gomel, you have experience with egg, egg freezing. I know it. I don't know if you want to uh, uh, explain you what you, your experience with that, with S Spain fertility clinics. Go ahead. Look, the issue is this. First of all, when a young person 
has pain, she should be totally investigated. No, you know, you shouldn't say, okay, you know, you just started uh, uh, <clears throat> menstruating, etc. You know, it should it should be it should be taken uh, as a job to see her frequently and if necessary to do a laparoscopy. You know, you can do today a laparoscopy with a, with a very small, very uh, a caliber of scope that is very thin, but you can see everything very well. So, you know, you don't have to go with a 10 millimeter scope. You can do a very good uh, diagnosis and treat it appropriately to what you see if necessary during that same uh, diagnostic laparoscopy you can do some surgery uh, and 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 remove what is there so uh, that is essential and that patient who has endometriosis should be seen after you know, a young woman shouldn't just be neglected. And it should be, and you know, surgery, the best surgery is the first surgery. But the first surgery should be done by someone who knows what he is doing, by an expert. And that's, that's uh, the whole thing. Dr. Gomel, I, thank you very much. We have to stick to the time. so. I apologize, but there are questions to you specifically by a very, uh, very uh, interested pe uh, people uh, repeatedly. I will come back, but I would like to thank Dr. Ted Lee, Dr. Einerson, Dr. Ihan, if and Dr. Kazali. I wish we had more time. I would love you guys to stick around, but I cannot, uh, obviously this is Sunday. You have things with your family. These are subjects that you've seen before, but we have an exciting fertility panel coming. So thank you again to all. Uh, we are moving with the schedule. With the fertility panel, we have uh, very interesting uh, talks. It is starting with uh, Dr. Um, Lilo Mettler, then be followed by Dr. Tomer Singer, Dr. Koderman, and Dr. Joanna Lekovich. Uh, except Joanna, I know personally the rest of the speakers has considered them as friends, uh, almost family members. Uh, Dr. Mettler is an icon and, and veteran, surgeon, a pioneer, student of Dr. Sam, which Harry also admits he learned something, many things from Dr. Sam. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting Dr. Metler uh, at Kiel, uh, beautiful establishments. There are more stories to that, but besides that, she is going to talk about limits of endometrioma surgery in infertility patients. Lilo, I hope you're online and we're I'm excited and to have thank you. Thank you. Thank you much for the introduction. As you can see, my background, I'm now in San Diego, California for the moment with my husband and not in Kiel, but I greet you all. Um, my lecture has been given, I will just go briefly into the topic, actually, number, topic number five from Eriko Zuki. Zuki is on the same line, can we do less and still be helpful to our patients? And uh, I especially want to refer to endometriomas in this discussion. We are living in a time when we have a lot of technical progress, certainly in the field of diagnosis, and applying visual tools like laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. We have better visualization, miniaturization, molecularization, and computerization. So we can really dig into the topic quickly. We do know that endometriomas, and I bring this up as the first topic to talk about, uh, we used to operate them very aggressively. We understand from many publications that after every endometrioma surgery, we have a drop of one of the most characteristic features of the ovarian reserve of the female, which is the anti-Millerian hormone, besides others. So that tells us, do we anything wrong in our patient? That may be after two months, after three months, a little less, but still evident. We have learned 
that surgical treatment could exert a further detrimental impact on ovarian reserve. And uh, we know that we can strip out many healthy follicles by ovarian stripping, by in PCOS patients, by doing extensive drilling. Um, the easier the stripping in endometriomas, the more follicles get stripped off. So that whole Tika and granulosa cell production of hormone zone is very delicate in the ovary. And if we have a big endometrioma, we have to carefully, carefully go about it, not to take out healthy ovarian tissue and bring the patients maybe in menopause. I remember three cases in my now 40 years in laparoscopic surgery that were the best of our intention those patients were left amenorrhoic after bilateral endometrioma resection. So we have to take in consideration the symptoms of the patient if she wants to get pregnant. It's very different than if she comes with pain. Size of the cyst, accessibility of the cyst, past medical surgical history, age and her ovarian reserve at present, and the wish. Does she come because of pain or does she come to get a baby? So if she wants to get pregnant, that stands on the forefront. And the present advice is to operate as carefully and as less as necessary. If she comes to an IVF clinic and she's had previous surgeries and we say, okay, we do not want to puncture such a, or to do another endometrioma enucleation by laparoscopy. We use this rest of ovarian reserve. She has to stimulate the follicles. During follicular puncture, we should not puncture the endometrioma. We give her even antibiotic protection. And we get the follicles, we puncture them, we get the oocytes, we try to get her pregnant. Have in mind that in the future she could in about 1% develop malignancy, so the endometrioma has at some time be considered, but we go carefully. So summarizing how we go a day, if a patient with endometrioma uh, that wants to get pregnant, we look at her history, size and accessibility of the symptoms, uh, size and accessibility of the ovary, symptoms, ovarian reserve, medical surgical history, and her wish. And then we decide whether we go for surgery, it's mostly laparoscopic surgery today, or we give, make a pre-treatment with GnRH analog for three months and then go to IVF, or we go directly to an ovarian controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, OSAT collection, uh, ICSI or IVF treatment and embryo transfer. So in this context today, we can help the patients. And the summary of all this, you'll find in my book, Endometriosis, a concise practical guide to current diagnosis and treatment, in which um, three of the present panel have also written chapters and they can be downloaded uh, for free from the medical library. Thank you very much for your attention of this part of our panel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, do we do we want to take some questions for Dr. Mepler before we start for the, with the next uh, presenter? Okay, we have, there's, let me, let me get back to that one, one second, it's down here. Where did it go? What is the possibility, the possible cause of endometriosis? Something like that, yeah, but that's not, yeah. Yeah, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be one. Uh, Okay, possible cause of endometriosis, we can give long, long lectures about. Do I answer that or in a, in somebody else of the panel? I don't know. <laughs> well, you can, you can, since you have the microphone now. Okay, so uh, there are many theories of the development of endometriosis. The real cause we do not know, but a combination of genetic uh, reasons, uh, stem cell uh, reasons, uh, migration at, uh, in, at uh, menstrual flow, Met metaplasia and metastasis, all these kind of forms, the basis of um, the spread of these cells that are normally only in the endometrium in other organs form, for instance, these endometriomas. There is nothing we can really do to prevent it, but we can recognize it and treat it. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Mettler, there is also another question for you directed. This is uh, from a woman who has had Susan Desmond, uh, who has endometrioma exposure. The question goes, reads like this. What is your solution for a woman trying to get pregnant, six failed IVF transfer, no implantation, tried even donor and slash immune protocol. I am 51 year old healthy woman with an endometrioma on the left ovary, no other symptoms, but fertility and digestive sy symptoms are there. 
and I'm eating healthy and um, I'm very healthy. I also had appendicitis. This is the question. So what do you do about a patient like that? Is she, is she 51 years old, you said? She's 41. 41. So definitely if she has had seven um, IVFs, I would look what was the reason why she didn't get implantation. We don't know if she had no implantation or no embryos developed, but at 41 years of age, and if she doesn't have a big cyst or an endometrioma and anything that we can treat with a resection, I would continue with a really well uh, scheduled IVF program, uh, taking all the factors of her past into consideration. Thank you, thank you. I, I think we're gonna move on to the next um, presenter or in this panel, Dr. Tomar Singer. Uh, Tomar Singer is from Shady Grove uh, Fertility Group in, uh, in New York. I know Tomar from his residency and then he did his fellowship at Cornell. And he's a very trusted physician with good skills and He's going to talk about egg freezing for endometriosis. Should she rush? Well, this is a, the greatest topic of our times. Uh, Tomer, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Tomer, and thank you for inviting me. And, um, you know, I, we've given the, that talk um, a couple of weeks ago, and I think that the, the main focus that I want to emphasize is really the timing. And, um, I think it relates to the previous talks and when do we start picking up on endometriosis and even in young adults in their early 20s, as Dr. Sechkin, uh, you know, is well aware, we already pick up uh, severe endometriosis in some cases. And if the mainstay of the uh, egg freezing in 2012, when the American Society of Reproductive Medicine said that it's no longer experimental and, and usually women in their mid thirties are starting to explore egg freezing and mainly for social reason, mainly because they don't have the right partner or they're focusing on their career. I think with endometriosis, the paradigm is completely shifted well into the late twenties, early thirties. And the main reason for that is that we know that the patient is born with finite number of eggs. And we know that the best time to do egg freezing is when the eggs are gonna be at the best shape in terms of fertilization and creating euploid embryos and have the best chance of implanting whether you do genetic screening of those embryos or not. And I think that the more important thing is that we have to educate the general OBGYN and the PCPs that when a patient is complaining of pelvic pain, just like Dr. Gomel was saying, you need to start investigation and, and earlier the better. And AMH is a very good tool and a pelvic ultrasound is readily available in most uh, OBGYN offices. And if you see the patient on by manual exam already experiencing pelvic pain and there is nodularity, or if you find that there is an ovarian cyst, that's the time to incorporate also the ovarian reserve testing and do AMH and do an FSH, just like this slide shows here. I think that if you take the age and the FSH and the AMH and you incorporate an endophalcal count, you'll have a baseline. And whether the patient is 25 or whether she's 28, that's a good baseline to have. Just like you have a baseline mammogram in women who have family history of, uh, of breast cancer and you're starting it younger than age 40. So the same goes with the patient with pelvic pain or patient with strong family history of endometriosis or have symptoms that uh, are suggestive of dysmenorrhea or dyspareunia. Once you have that patient, and, and, and Dr. Sechkin, we've shared a lot of patients in the last 15 years, once they, they present with pelvic pain and the AMH is starting to be lower than what expected, and there are different normograms out there, and you can obviously consult with your fertility doctor and what's the right level that you want to start referring patients for a workup, then you really want to discuss the option of egg freezing. Because there is nothing worse than having a patient who presented with endometriosis in her mid-20s, has not done anything when it comes to her fertility, and she comes to see the fertility doctor at 35 with undetectable AMH, FSH that greater than 15, with bilateral endometriomas that were resected, and she says, you know, I'm, I'm an athlete, I exercise, I eat healthy, what's going on? Why is it that I'm not getting pregnant? Egg freezing is a very readily available um, a procedure uh, with a simple enterofalcal scan, you can tell the patient, this is what we got. You're now 25 years of age, your AMH is one, your FSH is start, starting to be become a little bit elevated, 10, 12. Those are the options. The options are just to monitor things, 
for every six to 12 months. The options are to uh, pursue egg freezing. And it's obviously a personal decision. I think that the main hurdle is really the, the financial aspect of it. And, uh, and, and knowing that you can safely complete an egg freezing cycle with, a, a, uh, with adding an letrozole or a lupron trigger that's you know, gonna reduce the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation or the pelvic pain, uh, and also uh, hopefully get the insurance companies to pay for it. I think that a 25 year old, when she hears that a cycle costs $7,500, doesn't matter if it's in Richmond, Virginia or in Tampa, Florida, that's a big hurdle. She's in college, she's single, you know, she's paying the rent. So that's where our focus, I think, and the endometriosis have been, uh, foundation has done a great deal of a job with supporting, with getting grants to those patients who cannot afford it. I think that that will be the, the real uh, game changer. Once it becomes just like any patient who's diagnosed with breast cancer and, and lymphoma and Hodgkin's, who automatically has a very good option of freezing eggs at the lower cost or the covered cost, I think that that will really change what we do. And, and you will be able to help from the surgical perspective uh, to those patients. And instead of doing three or four surgeries, you may have to do one or two surgeries that are a little bit more um, definitive because you're not as concerned because the patient already froze 20 or 24 eggs and she has a good chance of using those eggs in the future. How many times Dr. Sechkin and the other surgeon on the panel are very delicate with the ovary, it's an endometrioma, and you know, uh, you're know you taking half of it just because you want to leave some ovarian tissue behind and hope that you're not going to have to go back into that pelvis. So I think that there's a, a, a lot of things that we can change and improve, but the key is education, both of the patient and the general population and our doctors and the community, and also having the insurance companies to cover uh, those uh, treatment. I think that the main focus of the, the, the question was, should the patient rush? I think that the, the, the word rush has a little bit of a negative connotation to it, right? Because uh, we don't wanna feel like we're rushing the patient to do something that's unindicated. I think that it's important to tell the patient, you don't have to do egg freezing, that's clear. But this is what the statistics and this is what the data is showing us. This is the data of actually egg thaw outcome. Women that came and froze eggs in the, all the facilities of SGF in the 37 location and came back and used them. Most of our endometriosis patient will fall into that A to D category here. You can see the big difference if you freeze 20 eggs at age 30 in category A here, which will give you roughly about 80% chance of live baby. This is not a pregnancy. This is a take-home baby rate and 50% for a second baby compared to if you delayed it by 10 years or a decade, and you now have 20 eggs when the patient is 41 and the chance of taking one baby is 40% and the chance of a second baby is minuscule. So the younger the patient are, especially in the background of endometriosis, especially in the, at stage three, stage four, when the ovaries are already involved or the fallopian tubes are involved, not just with deep endometriosis is key. The younger, the better. We also know, going back to the question that um, and the audience was asking about the recurrent implantation failure with seven IVF. Yes, endometriosis, even in the background of a, a thick endometrial lining and with um, a good resection and mild uh, residual disease on the ovary has been shown to reduce the implantation rate significantly, up to 50% in some studies. In some cases, we have to discuss gestational carrier when patient done seven or 10 or 12 IVF cycles despite a good visual endometrial lining. We know that the, uh, the immune system is playing a role. We, we cannot pinpoint it to the right treatment, but incorporating Lupron, incorporating Letrozole, knowing the endometriosis disease in the background is key when treating patient, whether it's for egg freezing or for IVF. I think that that's really the key of what I wanted to, to discuss today. And, and this slide is actually very telling. If you look at the number of eggs that a patient has frozen and came back to use it, now with the technique called vitrification, which is the best technology that's out there, we know that if a patient is younger, the more eggs will survive the freezing and the thawing. And we're quoting anywhere between 85 and 90%, depending on the age, 90% in the young patient population and 85% when a patient is over 38. And then the fertilization rate is very similar but you can see that there's a lot of attrition from the 
and fertilized eggs to the blastocyst phase. And that's really where the significant decline happens. And a patient may think, well, I have 12 eggs with my reproductive endocrinologist. I was 39. Right after endometriosis surgery, I probably have three or four kids derived from those eggs. And when they look at this slide and say, okay, 15 eggs may mean only two high quality embryos. And with the implantation rate that's being lower with endometriosis, that may not even mean one baby. Then they realize that the sooner the better and, and that there is a, potentially a need for freezing more eggs than just 15 eggs at age 40. But it's an honest discussion that we have to have with our patient. And again, I think the main issue is financial. Most patients will come, will seek the initial consultation. Once they hear the medications are not covered, that the, the insurance companies do not consider endometriosis as a medical condition by their guidelines, that's really the main hurdle, I think. Thank you for uh, having me, uh, Dr. Sachin, for this important session. Thank you very much, Tomar. Uh, this was a great presentation. Um, one thing can uh, come up. I'm sure this is one of the questions. I, I, I cannot read the question because I can't find it right now. But the question was this. I have an endometrioma, four centimeters, with no symptoms, and I want to do egg freezing. Should I have my endometriosis removed first or should I do my egg freezing before? And I could also add to that question, what, could, what, do, you, what do you do technically, apart from obviously you're all good in doing, it, in doing egg retrieval, but avoiding the rupture of endometrioma during the egg, egg retrieval process. If you know you went through the cyst, mm -hmm. do you have different protocol of following the patient. I see in my practice quite a few ruptured endometrioma, abscess, or peritonitis type of case. Every year, four or five, easy. Okay, so if I'm seeing this this much in my little practice, God knows what's happening out there. Talk to me. So I think that you bring a very good point and a question that we're delving with every with every case that has a, a interest in freezing eggs and has an endometrioma. Number one is the communication between the endometriosis surgeon and the reproductive endocrinologist. And, and uh, you have to establish that relationship. It cannot be done in a vacuum that the patient shows up because she has low AMH and she's telling me I have a surgery lined up in two months and you haven't had that discussion. Just like I have the discussion with an oncologist and a breast cancer patient who's starting chemo or has a port place, the same goes. This is a medical condition and a surgical uh, intervention will be needed eventually. Now, how do we pick our patient? I think that the, it comes down to the, the, the next few things. How large is the endometrioma? The axis of both ovaries, the antral follicle count. If you have a patient with a very low AMH with bilateral endometrioma, who's gonna have a very deep resection of endometriosis and may not have the option of freezing eggs at all at the end of this procedure, you present with her the pros and the cons. If you happen to do an egg retrieval on a patient with endometrioma, and had to go to the endometrioma, of course, we're uh, covering those patients with, the, with antibiotics and with close follow-up to uh, make sure that the patient doesn't have chemical peritonitis or PAD, and we discuss it directly with the, with the surgeon. Because if the surgery is planned for uh, two months from now, you may, be one, you may want to move up that surgery. That discussion has to happen. Now, a lot of the time, the patient should not be starting with egg freezing because there is no access, there's a very limited um, number of follicles. And we've seen that patient who had good uh, endometriosis surgery had a better outcome after that. Now, in no way would you go for IVF when a patient has stage four endometriosis, ignoring the disease. So with egg, egg freezing, it's easier because you're not talking implantation. But how many patients did we have, Dr. Seshkin, that went for surgery, did egg freezing or IVF, went for surgery for cleanup, and then had a better implantation rate. That really should be something that we have to discuss. And without communication with the surgeon and the reproductive endocrinologist, the patient is gonna get lost in the shuffle because she's gonna get different answers from the IVF doctor and from the endometriosis surgeon. Lastly, I would say that sometimes you have to have the surgery for pain relief because the patient is not gonna tolerate the stimulation and having the ovary grow from two to three centimeter to five or six centimeter during the stimulation. And, and this will be a very challenging uh, 10 days of IVF or egg freezing stimulation. So it's a case by case basis. It depends on the access, 
depends on the ovarian reserve, depends on the anxiety level of the patient. Some patients want to know that they have some eggs in the basket, so to speak, before they embark on a big endometriosis surgery. And lastly, communication, communication, communication. Just answer me quickly. Is there any ethical consideration with respect to egg freezing towards in younger women, even adolescents? So we have a very specific protocol at Shady Grove, and we've done one case, a, a patient who's 16 years of age who came with her mom who had severe endometriosis, and, and we have a consent that both the parents and the patient have to sign. Uh, usually those are patients who uh, were sexually active, but at the time you may have to break the hymen during the procedure. I don't see an ethical dilemma when you're actually uh, doing fertility preservation for severe endometriosis, just like we do it for cancer patients who are adolescent. We Thank have you. to basically mimic those two conditions and get the coverage from the insurance and, and look at it the same condition. Thank you so much. Please stay, stay around because uh, I will introduce one more uh, panelist uh, and then we have quite a few questions. We may even go over time a little bit. It's my pleasure to introduce you Punar Kodaman. Uh, I can't tell you how long I know Punar, but that will uh, give away how old I am. So we're gonna pass that. So just to tell you, Punar is a brilliant uh, infertility IVF reproductive endocrinologist from Yale. And she's gonna talk about in vitro fertilization is the, uh, about tailored IVF protocols for endometriosis patients, tailored IVF protocols. So there are very qu uh, quite a few questions coming up to you, get ready. <laughs> and I would like you to really summarize your, your take of your talk so the patients can warm up. I have a summary of it, but I'd like you to do it yourself. Thank you so much, Pranar. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I did My full talk was recorded and is on, um, you know, available on your website. I'm just going to summarize the, the main po points of my talk, which were really to... Um, uh, review the considerations for patients with endometriosis who have been who are planning on undergoing IVF, and there are really four areas that we have to consider: the pretreatment phase, the actual stimulation of the ovaries, the controlled ovarian stimulation, the trigger shot, which is used to mature the eggs prior to egg retrieval, and of course the embryo transfer. So um, the pretreatment strategy of uh, using uh, Lupron or GnRH agonist for three to six months prior to uh, initiating the IVF stimulation has come under a little bit of question for the general endometriosis population. Um, the older uh, meta-analysis was replaced by a new uh, Cochrane review in 2019, which demonstrated the uncertainty of the, of the um, benefit of this treatment generally speaking, for all endometriosis patients, though it should be noted that for certain patients, patients who um, you know, may delay their IVF start, who've had previous failures, who um, have severe pain or large endometriomas, that this still may provide a benefit. I think there, there's uncertainty there. Um, more recently, uh, Dr. Ziegler and others have looked at the use of oral contraceptive pills prior to IVF stimulation as a pretreatment, and there may be a benefit there. Again, the available studies are a little bit limited. Um, the, the one from 2010 was retrospective, and the control group, unfortunately, was a little bit older, but there did seem to be a benefit on clinical pregnancy rate with pretreatment of uh, oral contraceptives for six weeks. There is a current ongoing randomized controlled trial of three months of oral contraceptive pills versus GnRH agonists, um, and hopefully we'll get some helpful answers that can um, help guide uh, our treatment, uh, treatments in the future for, these, um, and for our endometriosis patients. In addition, there is now the availability of an oral GnRH antagonist. Um, it's been approved for use in um, treatment of endometriosis-related pain as well as um, for the treatment of fibroids. And we are now beginning to look at it as a, as as a pretreatment for um, IVF uh, uh, in endometriosis patients. And again, that data remains to be seen. We're actively looking at that at our center as well. Um, so I won't go into the details of the studies that I just um, described for the sake of time, but um, when we get to the 
actual IVF protocol, there are several protocols to choose from. And a lot of times this is guided, um, you know, again, going back to what Dr. Singer was saying, based on patient um, factors, you know, everything has to be individualized, not just to the endometriosis diagnosis, but to other uh, patient factors, such as their age, their uh, ovarian reserve, whether or not there's a coexisting male factor, et cetera. All of these things will have some impact on the details of um, the IVF protocol we choose. But there are several protocols to choose from. When we look at the two most common, historically, the long protocol with GnRH agonists um, versus what we use more frequently now, which is a shorter protocol using GnRH antagonists, um, there, there is a little bit of debate as, as, if, as to whether one or the other is better for patients with um, endometriosis. There is a suggestion that certainly in more advanced endometriosis that um, GnRH um, agonists may provide a benefit in terms of more mature oocytes. And in this more recent study by Kalanska in 2017, there did to, seem to be a slight benefit of the long protocol um, compared to the OCP antagonist protocol in terms of um, clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rate of all per started cycle. Um, there was absolutely no difference um, when uh, frozen embryo transfers were considered. And the live birth rate was, was um, a little bit higher, again, with the um, antagonist. So um, another way to suppress uh, the, the ovaries prior to start of a stimulation would be to use um, uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate. And this, this speaks a little bit to some of the costs involved in IVF. A lot of the injectable medications, certainly when they're not covered, um, can be quite expensive and can be um, you know, the, the, the issue with moving on to IVF at all, or certainly for repeat cycles. So this, the use of um, MPA as a pretreatment, as, um, uh, as a suppressant, basically, uh, during the IVF cycle instead of GnRH agonist or antagonist has been more widely used certainly in our donor cycles and it has been looked at in IVF patients as well. I mean, in endometriosis patients as well. And there does not seem to be a difference in cl clinical pregnancy rate once the frozen embryo transfer cycles are done subsequently. So this could be an option that could limit cost um, for our endometriosis patients. But please note that when you do use medroxyprogesterone acetate instead of a GnRH agonist um, or, or antagonist, that of course um, frozen embryo transfer has to be done subsequently because of the negative impact of high dose progestin on the endometrium during the stimulation. In terms of the choice of gonadotropin, there's no specific data for IVF, I mean, for endometriosis uh, in, uh, uh, patients undergoing IVF. So again, you have to really consider the patient's uh, individual factors. Um, there is an unclear benefit, though, promising data is showing that perhaps letrozole in particular may benefit our endometriosis patients um, due to the negative impact of high endometrial uh, aromatase um, uh, on implantation. So letrozole is a medication that blocks uh, aromatase and may have a benefit. Um, and that's suggested certainly here in, um, in terms of uh, looking at the addition of letrozole uh, to, to an IVF cycle. This is initial data, early data, um, but it is certainly something to consider while um, uh, letrozole may have uh, an, an impact on the percentage of mature oocytes and endometrial thickness that is um, slightly uh, deleterious, but probably not clinically significant, you can see that the clinical pregnancy rate is um, quite similar. So um, that brings us to also poor responders. Um, sometimes when we have endometriosis patients who have undergone cystectomies who are older or have impaired ovarian reserve, we do have to then also weigh in the fact that they may not stimulate as well. Um, they may um, require more gonadotropins, longer duration of stimulation, and um, we often end up with fewer oocytes retrieved. So there are strategies that we can use to try to maximize outcome because a lot of it, of course, will depend on how many eggs we get and the quality 
of those eggs. So um, sometimes that long protocol with GnRH agonists may oversuppress and thereby limit the response to ovarian stimulation. In those cases, we may use a mini flare or microdose luprolide protocol or antagonist protocols. Um, in some of our poor responders, we're also using duo stimulation, which hasn't specifically been studied in endometriosis patients, but theoretically should be helpful. And in this, in this situation, we stimulate the ovaries. Um, we use a GnRH agonist trigger with no plan for a fresh transfer. We retrieve those eggs. Ovulation pickup is here. They get a break for a few days, and we get right back into it with controlled ovarian stimulation and a subsequent um, GnRH agonist trigger and retrieval. In that case, um, we may uh, maximize um, oocyte recovery by making use of um, less mature eggs that we may not have been able to retrieve at the time of the first retrieval. So there are also several poor responder strategies, which are not the focus of my talk today. They've been nicely reviewed by Kelts et al. a few years ago. Um, a lot of these are somewhat experimental. We do play around with them, again, depending on individual uh, patient factors to try to optimize response. Um, but I, I will not go into those at, uh, uh, for the purpose of today's talk, um, or summary, I should say. Um, trigger considerations, we do um, find that if you use a GNR agonist, GNRH agonist trigger, that can limit pain symptoms. So certainly for the patient who is going to undergo subsequent surgery due to pain, et cetera, this would be a good consideration. Um, it can be combined with a GnRH antagonist or a medroxyprogesterone acetate-based protocol. And it certainly should be considered if there's any signs of ovarian hyperstimulation or if there's plans for pre-implantation genetic testing, if it's just um, you know, egg freezing and there's no plans for embryo transfer. As I mentioned, the dual stimulation protocol does require a GnRH agonist trigger. Otherwise, we can, of course, use a regular HCG trigger. Um, if there is no plan for fresh embryo transfer, please remember that we can depress ovaries um, soon after egg retrieval and minimize uh, pain symptoms that way again, uh, also. Finally, I'm just going to briefly touch upon deferred embryo transfer. In general, this is something we consider. Um, in terms of not doing a fresh transfer and, and doing a frozen embryo transfer later to optimize synchronization between the developing embryo and endometrium. Um, we know that the utopic endometrium and endometriosis is abnormal. And um, when we stimulate ovaries during controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, the estrogen levels do tend to get quite high and that can perhaps exacerbate um, the endometriosis abnormalities in the endometrium and thereby um, affect implantation. And so using a deferred embryo transfer strategy allows for us to um, overcome that issue um, and better synchronize, optimize the um, endometrium for implantation in the subsequent cycle. And this has been shown um, not too long ago in 2018 that deferred embryo strategy does improve cumulative pregnancy rates and endometriosis related infertility. Um, and those are pretty significant results, both in terms of cumulative clinical pregnancy rate, as well as ongoing pregnancy rate and minimiz minimizing the miscarriage rate in our endometriosis patients. So um, th that's my summary. Um, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, well, there are a lot of questions, especially for you. Okay, uh, I'm ready. I'm <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's start with one question. Uh, I I, uh, I think it's fair to ask you this. She says uh, th she does. I think her name is Caitlin Richards. She says thank you for this helpful information. You mentioned that the long protocol of GnRH range agonist can be beneficial if there is adequate ovarian reserve. Are you aware of any data comparing IVF results after the long GnRH range protocol with results after laparoscopic excision surgery? Number one. Number two. And in your opinion, is long course is beneficial for patients who have recently had through uh, excision surgeries? Um, so uh, after an excision surgery, um, you know, oftentimes we can't uh, jump straight away to an IVF cycle due to need for recovery, due to you know, significant um, 
post-operative pain. And um, so it, it is, in my opinion, um, advantageous. I mean, that could be a situation in which you could consider um, a pretreatment, right? Um, either with a GnRH agonist or with our oral GnRH antagonist, and then um, transition into an IVF cycle once the, um, you know, the, the patient has recovered from surgery and is ready to move on to IVF stimulation. Certainly that's what I would do in my practice, um, you know, as, as someone who, who does a surgical treatment of endometriosis patients who then thank desire. You, you. I mean, it, it does make sense for giving some time for the patient to recover. Um, Dr. Martin, right. is there any specific questions you have under Fort Kunar? I have two more from the same person, so uh, I want to be fair with for other questions too. Do you have any questions specifically for Tom Kunar? The uh, there were some IVF. Let's, let's see. I'm, I've got all these questions. The questions we're, I'm dealing with right now are the ones that are on the question and answer session. So let me. So let me have done. I have my. Yeah, why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you do those? Gunnar, you mentioned that MPA can be used as alternative to Gianna range agonist if the implantation is planned. Is there any data? Again, she's asking data. Is there any data comparing the effectiveness of oral progesterone suppression with MPA versus GnRH suppression? And how far in advance embryo transfer should, should suppression be stopped in order to optimize success rate? Thank you very much, she says. Thank you for uh, another thoughtful question. So um, I found one study specifically in endometriosis patients looking at the use of MPA and it was in a GnRH um, uh, agonist short protocol. So starting it sort of shortly before or around the time of stimulation. And there really was no difference in outcome. So it is comparable, um, but again, deferred embryo transfer must be planned. Um, it is really only used until um, the time of trigger. So a fresh frozen embryo cycle or deferred embryo transfer um, can be done with the subsequent cycle. So um, it really does not represent uh, or lead to a, a significant delay by any means. Thank you. This question coming up for doc, if Dr. Mettler with, is with us. She's there. Uh, or Tomar. Well, surgeons can also, other surgeons can answer this. When doing surgery for infertility, reasons not pain, just for infertility, when and where would you leave endometriosis without excising it? This is simple. Dr. Mettler, you can have this question. Right. If the patient has a low ovarian reserve, very low, she's had previous surgery, then we'd be very careful to excise more and would maybe only open and make a very pointed coagulation on the lesion itself. Under good magnification, constant suction and irrigation, not to destroy ovarian cortex. Very nice. Thank you very much. I, I think for ovaries like that, as, as you know, we are extremely careful not burning the, frying the eggs. I always approximate the ovaries and suspend them at least 24 hours. Dr. Harry Rich is the hand. Harry Rich is raising his hand. Thank you. So uh, the, the bottom line is I, I do not like to leave any endo behind and I like to clean and uh, to the point of uh, extinction uh, with, uh, with reasonably though. So these patients, if they don't have that pain, obviously one has to be careful when dealing with uh, crucial organs. But just for the sake of this presentation, I have something in my data I want to share. Just, just one patient, interesting, Orelisa, Orelisa patient that we just did, uh, uh, we just did last week. Do, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is a patient we did uh, almost a week ago. It's 25 year old with severe dysmenorrhea, history of two laparoscopic ablation with fulguration. And she was put on Orelisa April 2019. For a year, she's been on Orelisa, no period but crazy endobelly, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. Stopped Orelisa a week ago, two weeks ago, and we operated her just a week ago here in Lenox cell. So this is what we found. This is the, 
She says, this is the fifth day of her period. She was burned before. Look at the amount of hemoperitoneum five days after. I mean, this is no joke, ladies and gentlemen. Look how much blood is there. And I, what, see what else is coming right after. So this is how it looks inside. And this is the blue dye we, I do personally, so I don't miss any peritoneal pathology. You see the holes on peritoneum. These are all defects affected by inflammation. And this is how in certain parts, it's deeply infiltrative. Even a year of Aurelissa she was on. And this is how her, the biopsies, excisions that I did. This is the whole 20 specimen we removed. All the yellows are positive areas, how much there was. So just letting you know that uh, I have another case exactly like this we did, but this time I have done the surgery, massively uh, 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 involved case. This is two years ago we've done, this is how I left two years ago, the cul-de-sac two years ago. And she came with symptoms two years later and look what I found. Again, during the time of period, you look at how much hemoperitoneum, fifth day of the fourth day of the period, and there's tons of uh, endo there. So I'm not gonna go over this due to time constraint. So uh, let's go back to the Zoom. Am I with you? Here I am with you again. Thank you. I didn't want to do case presentation here because this is not for me to present cases, but for all of us to learn from your experience. Again, I'd like to welcome and recognize all of you with my warmest uh, feelings from New York. I'm very excited. We are really dedicated team. Uh, I think we are family. We love you all like the song we started. So. <laughs> I am not sure uh, how much time we have, but uh, at least uh, in respect to patients who are still with 70 people still staying on a Sunday noon with us, they delayed their lunch. Uh, Dan, is, is there any questions you want to further move? There are questions. We, we, we'll end up answering them eventually in our website. And I promise, Dan, go ahead. So we have lots of questions. One of the ones that keeps coming up is something that was really a Passover question, but maybe the panel can answer it. When is nerve sparing needed and what does nerve sparing mean? Can I answer? Yes, nerve sparing surgery came up in the recent years or maybe already 10 years. It is surgery of excision of endometriosis without putting a new irritation or laceration to nerves and in, in the pelvic nerves. So there's a field of neuropelviology with um, our friend from Switzerland, Mark Fossowell. He puts all the attention that we are aware where the lymph nodes, where the nerves are, where the endometriosis is situated. It makes it clear to us that in some cases we cannot see the nerves, but in many cases we can. We should be very careful and look with more augmentation, take time, rinse, and give time to really see that we do not destroy a nerval structures of the autonomous or autonomous nerves in the minor pelvis, if not absolutely necessary, because endometriosis surgery is not cancer. So we should really be as careful as possible. Thank you very much. All right, Tomar, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Joanna Lukovic is not here today, will not be available. She apologized for that. But this question was for her. I would like you to answer if you can. Um, in general, your experience with BCL6 expression, and do you use that in your practice as a marker for endometriosis? How aggressive should the management be? Okay, so how this... expectant could be, or how aggressive the searching for endometriosis go on? What is the value of symptoms? What symptoms alert you more as far as fertility? the presence of endometrioma or not, please. Okay, so very good question that we face on a regular basis. I think mainly we'll face the BCL6 in the, in the presentation of recurrent implantation failure with patient with or without endometriosis. And that sometimes is the first hint 
that even if the patient is asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, she has a euploid embryo, PGS tested embryo, what we call now PGTA, that fails time after time or results in a biochemical pregnancy or early miscarriage. And those are patients that usually would benefit from either diagnostic laparoscopy or hysteroscopic uh, uh, assessment of the lining with sampling of the endometrium and testing for BCL. And those patients uh, can benefit from um, treatment. Uh, and many times it's gonna be a surgical treatment of endometriosis or antibiotics prior to a frozen embryo transfer. So BCL-6 as a, as a marker has never been shown in a randomized control study as the be all and all. But when we have a patient who's going through IVF time after time, there's le very limited um, data in terms of the uterine uh, uh, lining or the uterine receptivity. There's a company called iGenomics that is now offering an um, um, endometrial receptivity assay, which we're uh, assessing essentially a natural or, or program frozen embryo transfer and doing a sampling of the endometrium. So I make it a, as a habit that when I do an endometrial biopsy for ERA, to also look for endometrial for chronic endometritis and check for BCL and check for uh, plasma cells. Uh, and there is no one good randomized study that says that if BCL6 was positive and you treated it in one way or another, the implantation was significantly higher. Having said that, you're, you're dealing with very challenging condition with usually patient that had surgery after surgery or several IVFs. And at that point, an expert opinion will be uh, sufficient. And at that point, we'll really introduce the endometriosis uh, protocols into play. I would say that uh, we've had some success with patients who have failed natural frozen cycle because you're trying to avoid giving those patients estrogen for 10 weeks, right, in the first trimester. And we treat them sometimes with letrozole to induce ovulation. And that letrozole will reduce the endogenous estrogen, recruit a follicle, and at the end of the day, will give you thick endometrial lining with better implantation rate. So that's something that we um, uh, incorporate to patients with endometriosis. Uh, sometimes you'll have to treat the patient with Lupron for two or three months prior to doing a frozen embryo transfer when the patient has severe endometriosis. Going back to your question regarding the symptoms, severe desmenorrhea, severe dyspareunia, pelvic exam that shows a plaster uh, uterus or uh, really very uh, thick uh, uterus sacral ligaments, those are to me uh, very concerning uh, symptoms that will require doing surgery prior to doing a, an embryo transfer. The embryo transfer for the reproductive now just takes, you know, five minutes. You want to maximize everything up until leading to that point and, and to get the best outcome. Um, I hope that answers, uh, Dr. Sechin. Um, well, uh, I would like to respect everyone's time. Uh, I am delighted and privileged and humbled. Uh, and on behalf of foundation, I'd like to thank Endofonstat, Denis Kochash, Charlotte Wilson, Sarper Kojabik, Jean Rebillard, Melissa Bodro, Diane Falzon, Rachel Grabman, Mina Sechkin, and most of all to our executive director, Margaret Casper Cianci. If Margaret is here, I want her to say something in, in, uh, in support of uh, what, for the patients, what we are coming for them in the next future. Margaret, are you there? I'm here, Dr. Seshkin, thank you very much. And um, I wanted to share a quote with you that came across my phone today. And I think it's so appropriate for everything that took place. So Maya Angelou said, uh, if you get, give, and if you learn, teach. And really that's what the last two days have been. Uh, I really wanna thank all of our speakers and presenters for preparing their presentations in advance, for joining us on the weekend, and most importantly, for teaching this community. A special thank you to our Harry Rich awardee, Dr. Arno Wattier, and to our esteemed moderators, Dr. Tamer Seshkin, Dr. Dan Martin, Dr. Harry Rich, and Dr. Victor Gomel. And a special thank you to our scientific and medical director, Dr. Martin, for answering so many of the questions, which we will continue to do post-conference. The mission of the Endometriosis Foundation is to continue to create awareness, fund cutting edge research, advocate for the community and provide education. And we are so committed to educating both physicians and patients as we've seen this past weekend. Another wonderful opportunity for education is taking place in March during Endometriosis Awareness Month. 
we are delighted to announce that we are partnering with the International Society for Gynecological Endoscopy for a global virtual conference taking place in three different time zones. March 20th will also include a patient conference from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time zone. Information about that is available on ISGE's website and more details will be coming on the EndoFound website. Also, please watch our website and social media for the premiere of, drum roll please, EndoTV with host and executive producer Diana Falzone on January 26th. And we are releasing as a teaser, one of the first episodes this week about a timely topic, COVID and endo, which will be released on our website this coming week. Finally, none of this would take place without all of your support as we are a nonprofit organization. We rely on your contributions and appreciate anything that you can donate in honor of someone or because you wanna see more programs like today and the one on March 20th. Again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Margaret. I'm delighted for you to show your face to all, <laughs> everyone. And uh, we're looking forward to have the meeting in March. Uh, for all uh, attendants, the passcode is Endofound, capital ENF, 2020. Uh, please uh, get back, if you get back to, the, to these uh, recordings, uh, forward your questions, we will direct the presenter. Our place is to help you. Endometriosis Foundation is founded to help you and to, to advance the science, primarily the theory of the endometriosis. So these diseases are diagnosed and treated timely as early as possible. And that's the only way to prevention. And it is possible in good organized environment, probably we can decrease the reoperation rate to 10%. Patient needs not only surgery, they need personalized follow-up and care. And that's the and the surgery should be of high quality with tissue diagnosis, videotaping, being transparent, and with complete education, creating bilateral trust between patient and the doctor. Patient has to trust the pa doctor. Doctor has to trust the patient. Families should be involved. Patient needs education and support. Thank you for all. We love you and looking forward to see you again soon.